Good evening, everybody, and welcome to FUSD's Board Budget Subcommittee for October 23rd for our board meeting, excuse me, October 25th for our board meeting of October 27th. Trustee Prasad, Trustee Zhang, I will turn the meeting over to you. Okay. okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Go ahead, Trustee Zhang. You can leave the meeting. Oh, I'm trying to find my, where is my camera? Um, okay. I cannot see you guys, but I, uh, so let's right move on to our. So let's items. check if there are any public comments before we oh. go to the agenda. I have not received any public comments. Now, I have not. Do we expect to, uh, like other um, uh, uh, Brown Act me committee meetings, uh, do we actually have a live uh, public comment section here at all, or this continues to be written public comments only? We allow public comment to be submitted within the meeting, um, but we have not received any public comment thus far. Okay. If we happen to receive any during the meeting, we're happy to include that in our conversation and share it out. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Got it. Now I'm better. Um, okay, so I can see the first, uh, let's move to the items. The first one is 10.1. Uh, uh, approve the staff recommended textbook adoption of AP computer science principles. And uh, can you give us a, a, a brief in, uh, introduction of these items, uh, CJ? I'd be happy to. Thank you, Trustee Zhang. So this is for AP Computer Science Principles. There's 144 students enrolled in this program at American High School. I do want to clarify for our audience that may be watching or other staff that may be watching. We do offer AP Computer Science at our other high schools but the AP Computer Science Principles is specific to American High School. This is just under $35,000. The reason it seems to be a much more affordable adoption uh, is because of the number of students involved being only 144. Um, so I have a question. When you see that uh, only American High offer computer science principles, what, what uh, what the computer science uh, programs offered in other schools? Different title? So the other schools offer AP Computer Science. This is just a, a separate AP Computer Science Principles class, but all of the high schools, all of our comprehensive high schools offer AP Computer Science. Okay. So yeah, I would it's, assume, it's hmm? good that we are expanding uh, beyond just the basic AP computer science. And there's more theory yeah, of computer science involved in this course. So um, as a, uh, I suppose as a board, we are looking to expand our scope of uh, and our program that's available to students. So this is a good direction. Um, just to clarify, so, so when students take AP exam, so there is two computer uh, AP AP exams. Uh, you know, my, my kids are not quite there yet. Can Vivek, do you know there is like two kinds of AP exams? Yeah. See, this this would be two different AP. These are two different AP courses, two different AP tests that students will take. Uh, so AP Computer Science is a different course compared to AP Computer Science Principles. This would be. Uh, uh, now at American, I suppose we are offering both and some students will take one or the other or both. Okay. Thank you for the explanation. So, um, so this one, I don't have a problem. No, this is good. Good. Okay. So let's, um, move on to, um, the 10.2. 
the MOU with Tutor Me for academic tutoring. So this is for unduplicated students, and this is the regular LCAP item. And I suppose I didn't ask the question, is the dollar amount any higher than last year, or is it similar? Uh, I will have to check. This does not, um, in the initial language, show to be a renewal. Um, so I will have to check and see if there's any change in the rates year over year. Uh, we may have that information next year. Uh, because as part of our LCAP goal, it's part of our three-year plan. Okay. And uh, as you pointed out, uh, Trustee Prasad, these are for students who qualify under the McKinney-Vento Act. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. So I have no questions on that. So actually, this is the first year we, 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 we enter such agreement, right? Is the first time we use this program? I believe it is the first time. I will I will double check on that with our staff to make sure. Okay. And the third one is um ten point three. Uh, NPS NPA agency for special ed. And this one is additional 500,000 uh, in reference to last time we see, I think around 500,000 as well. Yes, yeah, so these are for contracts for placements with non-public schools or services through a non-public agency. Generally, these will be specific to special education students and programs. And so the non-public agency agreement is for physical therapy, speech and language, occupational therapy, registered behavior technicians, and registered nurse support. The non-public school placements are specific to five students. One of the adjustments is a change in service. The other are placements and then additional services from extended school year. Um, so I look at uh, our uh, September, the uh, uh, audited actual, you know, financial report. And I would think that this would be on the, on the expenditure, on the service and operating expense. And last year is 11.4 million. So um, I would expect we would see this kind of item, you know, more in, in the coming months because right now we have only see what's that 11 million I don't remember the the dollar amount um or oh, we are quite there there's a there's a number of things that will happen with that expenditure trustee Zhang and mm -hmm. so one of them is that when we make the allocation we make the uh, the agreement for the year Sometimes not all of the services are realized in a year, so there might be an ending fund that's not used. It's also possible that we may need to contribute more dollars to that than we anticipated. Mm -hmm. I think when we look at that year over year, we'd want to look over the last three years mm -hmm. uh, because last year may have been a bit of an anomaly in terms of services provided by non-public agencies and non-public schools in light of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. There may have been some expenditures that weren't realized because maybe not all services were delivered mm -hmm. <clears throat> depending on if those schools like Fremont Unified were also in a distance learning format. Additionally, we would want to also take a comparative look at what our expenditure is related to other districts of 33,000 to 35,000 students mm -hmm. and, and see where our trends are as well. Uh, certainly, our staff is watching what our budgeted amount is mm -hmm. and how much our encumbered amount is and, and making sure that we're keeping an eye on those things. I would anticipate mm -hmm. that moving forward, we would see these slow down a bit because now we are into the end of October. Most services and placements have begun to settle for the year. And while we still may see a few of these, uh, they likely won't come in successive meetings the way they have recently. Mm -hmm. 
but I also just want to monitor to see whether the special ed students, uh, whether they're increasing or decreasing, you know, whether this, uh, you know, relate to COVID for. Yes, that's something that we will be watching as well. Uh, one of the requirements when assessing a student for special education services under IDEA mm -hmm. is that we have to consider environmental factors before determining if there's a qualifying condition for special education. So I know our school psychologists and resource teachers and case managers that are conducting our evaluations and assessments on students are considering those things as well, because we may see some gaps in learning and other environmental impacts that are not specific to an identified learning disability that will qualify for special education, but perhaps other factors. And so we have to make sure that we rule those out as well. But we're certainly looking at what our number of students each year is that are qualifying for special education. And as we noted on our last agenda, because we were uh, disproportionate in certain areas, I know that's something that our director is keeping a very close eye on as well. Right, that's also a very good point. I, I think we want to help those students so we can reduce the number of students could possibly become a special ed. Yes, we want to provide early intervention as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And we know that oftentimes helps reduce the need for additional specialized services. All right. Now, uh, mm -hmm. One thing um, that uh, we'd want to see for, from next time is uh, maybe a, a table of uh, the different providers and how much uh, have we uh, contracted with them? Because uh, some of these contracts are incremental contracts with sim same or similar providers. Yes, we can uh, look at the rates uh, across the region. Non-public schools do have different costs. Uh, some of them provide different services and non-public agencies also have some different rates and we can include uh, what those are. We do most of the time have a master contract that we're working through or a master agreement that we're working through with our CELPA to make sure that Fremont Unified uh, is getting a fair rate in comparison to other districts as well, but we can review that information. Yeah, no, my ask was slightly different. It just uh, so for each, each NPA, NPS, because we have multiple different uh, at different times of the year, we we come up with incremental services we are getting from them. So it would be good to have like what uh, Trustee Zhang said, $11.4 million was the amount from last year. Mm -hmm. Where do we stand year to date to this year? And, and how is it divided across uh, maybe 20 plus uh, agencies that we contract with? So having a running total of that would be good to, to have. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, so the next one with the budget impact is 11.4. Additional FTE for child nutrition services. Mm -hmm. So this is an additional part-time food service position to assist with the increased meal service at Horner. It is a 0.375 position with a focus on helping at lunch services. Okay. Hmm? There was some concern about service time at other schools, right? So um, I think Trustee Zhang, you were raising that earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. Do we have uh, do we have this the time to get everybody meals? Uh, is that managed enough at other sites or will this come or would we need more uh, at other sites as well uh, i think right now we're doing well at other sites our director of uh, child nutrition services is monitoring that food service across the district and uh, this was one of the ident identified areas where we needed some additional staffing support I think in other places, while not uh, perfect, we are making progress in reducing the amount of wait time. Um, so the so so the 
the increased time is because we implement uh, uh, to check the student's ID. So now you think students are getting used to showing their ID. So then uh, the line is getting shorter. Well, I think that we have traditionally checked IDs, uh, but we do have more students participating in meal counts in a number of schools. And the reason we have to check the IDs is to make sure that we are tracking the meals served and who they're served to, because that is how we seek the reimbursement funds from the mm -hmm. federal government for our meals. But it is not uncommon for the first month or so of school mm -hmm. for students to get reacquainted with a new practice or a new procedure. And I believe most students have a barcode on their student ID that they can use and scan and, and that should help. So I think that's helped reduce some wait times as well. Yeah, I, I heard a complaint is because they start to check student ID and that caused delay in the line. So if students get used to that, and I think that should, uh, you know, uh, reduce the, 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 the waiting time. And I have a question on going back to 11.3, uh, approve athletic coaches winter. So my question is, do we hire coaches at different time? And, um, you know, I, I see this uh, items coming from time to time. My assumption is we hire coach at the beginning of the, the school year. So, so what, what is our practice? So we will hire coaches throughout the year. Okay. Uh, we have three main seasons of sports. We have the fall, the winter, and the spring. And so a lot of our hiring will take place associated with those seasons. And coaching by definition is a, is a temporary position. And so our hiring will take place year round. Uh, it, it happens with every season. Sometimes it's in advance of the season when we have uh, everything lined up and ready to go. Sometimes it will happen just after the start of the season. Is that because we could not find those coaches until now? Because I look at some uh, tennis coaches. So that is all year round uh, a program. Uh, some of the sports are all year round, uh, but it's important to note that they're not they're not all year round in terms of the actual operational season of the sport. So the stipends are paid to coaches for the season of the sport mm -hmm. and the NCS sets specific time frames by which a program can operate and practice and compete. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, voluntary off season conditioning programs that sports can participate in. Mm -hmm. But our coaching hiring is, is really done by season, even though we recognize, for example, that a football coach or a basketball coach or uh, a, a number of coaches from this list, for example, mm -hmm. will have the actual season in which the sport participates. Mm -hmm. And they will have also preseason, offseason conditioning, uh, a number of things that will happen throughout the year for the student athletes. Mm. Okay, thank you. And then so this one, the budget would be under which category for the for the coaches? I mean, even though this one is not a budgetary item, it would be under well, it's, budget, it's budgetary in the sense that it's there are stipends that are associated with the position. So it's a it's a stipended salary. And that's part of what what we fund. I see. Okay. Thank you for that. Let's see what else. Okay. Um, okay. So next big items is uh fourteen point five elementary and the secondary school emergency relief, the third plan. The we... So that is item 14.4, and that is our ESSER, uh, elementary and secondary school emergency relief plan. It, we have commonly referred to it as ESSER 3 because we've received three rounds now of ESSER funding. <clears throat> this round of funding is just below $8.4 million. 
and the state requires that the staff bring forward to the board for approval the plan for expenditures. And so attached to this agenda item is the plan for expenditures. You'll note that uh, the, the biggest piece of the expenditures for ESSER dollars is really looking at our virtual academy staffing. As you'll recall from prior meetings, we <clears throat> hired roughly 50 teachers for that work. And mm -hmm. you'll see that uh, the planned ESSER three expenditures here are uh, at 4.6 million. You'll see that there are some other funds related to the COVID-19 safety plan. And you will also see some e-log dollars there. And you'll also see uh, the office assistant positions, for example, that we've talked about and contact tracers. Mm -hmm. So um, 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 can you clarify? I thought e-log is a state, California state funded plan. And then ESSER is a uh, uh, what federal. So why we add this uh, uh, e log into this uh, ESSER? Because <clears throat> some of the goals uh, uh -huh. may align very closely, and so when our e log goals are aligning with the ESSER goals, we want to make a notation. We're still highlighting that they're e log expenditures, but we're highlighting those in this plan as well. And I can okay. ask uh, Assistant Superintendent Salinas to review that with our board when we get to the meeting on Wednesday night. So we 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 basically we address that we are addressing these issues, but the funding is coming from ELOG, and then we are not including the dollar amount into our S three. Is that right? Right. Okay. I mean, yeah this this is reflective of uh, eight point three million dollars, and so. There are some aspects of this that that overlap a little bit. So, for example, our e-log uh, dollars, our intervention teachers. So there are some things that overlap. Most of this is going to fall directly to our ESSER three. Mm -hmm. um, so this one is to be uh, invested in the next year. Uh, this is next year, and it carries on. This year and to the year after as well, I believe. I'll have to pull that information up. I mean, till what, 2023? Because I was trying to look at definition of a one, two, three. Um, so this one is um, to be received after we get approval, then we all receive this amount. Yes. And so this will go through the county office as well. After the after our board, uh, pending our board's approval, it will go to the county office. Mm -hmm. So that means we still have like four million and to be uh, to be um, identified, right? The four million we don't have a plan yet. Is that right? No, this I, this identifies eight point three. Yes. Million, two million dollars. Right, but then you look at the last one. Use of any remaining funds five point oh no five point four million. So that one, we, we don't know yet, right? You know, if you look at the first, second page, um, um, the first one is the strategy for continuous and safe in-person learning, which is 700,000. The second one is address lost instructional time, uh, minimum 20% of uh, LEA, uh, is uh, from this fund is 2.2 million. And then the, the third one is the use of any remaining funds. So then we have a 5.49 million. Yes. And we don't have a plan. I think it's, it's, it's reasonable because we don't have to have a plan yet. We, we do have a plan for that. Below that we number, do. you'll see that 4.6 million of that is for staffing. And then oh. you'll see some other allocations for secondary virtual academy teachers, uh, supplies and materials for the virtual academy, the assistant principal for the virtual academy, um, and then an additional firewall and redundant services 
which supports the technology needs for the virtual academy and for the district as a whole. And so that's where that uh, $5.49 million is allocated mm -hmm. in the plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, but so, so this one is for what time? Do we, I need to know, is for next school year? It's from a... The, the bulk of this, for example, the 4.6, uh, the $4.68 million for the elementary virtual academy teachers mm -hmm. that's for this year. The secondary virtual academy teachers, the elementary principal for the assistant principal, sorry, and the clerical positions, those are all for this year. There are some things like the uh, firewall and redundant services that will carry forward. Mm -hmm. uh, the budgeted amounts for intervention teachers are for this year. And then if there's things that are not spent, uh, I do believe that ESSER provides us an additional time frame to expend those dollars. But I believe most of this plan will be expended this year. Okay. So well, that means we have nothing um, much left for next year. <laughs> right? Well, we are looking at, we have an extension on the time to spend our e-log dollars. That changed after the original plan was approved. And so our staff will be looking at how we do that. And remember that we'll provide the Board of Progress report. I right. believe we're scheduled to do that in January on our ELOC expenditures. Okay. So yeah, we're still I, monitoring I our I, ESSER one and two dollars. Yes, yeah, so our, our virtual academy is fairly special, right? Not many school districts are doing that. So, so that uh, our prioritization was to make sure kids get get live instruction so the, the dollars i think these are dollars well spent now uh, these one-time dollars will go away and uh, we need to get back to our budget with regular dollars so there would be some cushion i suppose with some e-log dollars and and other funds the one-time funds available um, so it won't be a, a significant amount correct and i and i think it's important just to make sure that we're we're watching these one-time expenditures because uh, like many other districts, there's an increase in, in the amount of money that we have currently available, but being mindful that many of those dollars are one-time dollars. And so we have to be careful not to uh, build something that is ongoing on a foundation of one-time dollars. Mm -hmm. So have you uh, received more uh, requests to, for students to go back to in-person learning? I know we're going to do something about survey, um, but... We do, we've continued to see periodic requests. Uh, we haven't seen, I think, a big, a big shift other than what the, the, the normal pattern has been the last month or so, which is uh, families here and there desiring to go back. I think the next development that will take place is we anticipate perhaps by the end of this week even that we will receive approval for vaccines for students 5 to 11 years old and if that's the case then after students are fully vaccinated we anticipate seeing a large number of those students going back to in-person instruction and as you indicated we'll be sending out a survey hopefully some point this week to our mm -hmm. families in the virtual academy to gauge their interest in returning to in-person instruction Mm -hmm. So, so there could be a shift in January, right? Um, Correct. That's what, possible. Possible. Okay. So, what else? And then the next two are the fourteen point six and or the the two construction related. Uh, mm. In the printed document, it's 14.6 and 7, I think. Uh, in the online version, it's different. Yes, and uh, it's 14.5 uh, is the RICS project. 14.6 is the uh, American High School Modernization Contingency Fund and the Washington High School Theater. Just for clarity for anybody who's watching, uh, we did pull one item just prior to publication we were awaiting the maps from our demographer for the updated uh, voting regions and the maps were not complete in time for publication of this agenda. So those will go on the next meeting. 
Okay, so uh, here's a question. I suppose we need a crystal ball, right? So we've done multiple amendments to this project for uh, because of dry rot that we are finding. So, so what do we, where do we think we are at in terms of finding more? Well, at this point in time, as of Friday of last week, um, we think we have found everything because we have basically demolished all of the interior spaces that there potentially could have been any uh, mold or rot or termites that would still exist. So with what we have prepared for you here, that is a definitive budget that has been prepared based on that scope of work that we've done to complete the job that we started out with initially. Um, one of the things that it's hard for me to sort of explain the scope of this project, because it's my understanding that this project started way back in 2014 with uh, the initial, I guess, repurchasing of the project back from the Stratford School to FUSD. And initially they were planning to do a full modernization and overhaul of the entire facility, but that budget when they finished that analysis came in at about $16.5 million. And of course the school district did not have the resources at that time to do that because that was prior to the existing bond that we have in measure E. So uh, I guess some concerned parents as well as different constituent groups within Fremont um, basically you know, asked the board, you guys have to do something to provide resources for this particular demographic of student. And so, what we have in front of us is a very scaled down version of what was initially proposed, I believe, back in 2015. So um, we're, we're not getting a bargain in the sense that, you know, we're, we're still spending millions of dollars, but we, of course, are not spending $16 million that was initially earmarked or, or estimated. So I think for what we're doing in terms of the scope of work, and the scale of the project that we undertook, um, we are getting the best value for the dollars that we are spending. And I believe at the end of the day, when we finish this project, uh, the community, community will be very happy and then we will have the best space for our students to exist in that'll be healthy and safe and, and um, you know, fungus free and all that other stuff. So um, it's, it's just kind of how this project has evolved. So. So what would be the total expense after this? Pardon me? What would be the total um, bill after this? Uh, after um, this? Right now, and I apologize for not having it on the tip of my tongue. Um, right now, if we were to total everything that we've expended to date, minus the purchase of the property itself, uh, we would be at $9.2 million. Okay. And the original 16 million, did that, was that like a complete demolition and, and then rebuild? The $16 million is my understanding. Um, that was the original estimate to basically fully um, renovate and bring the school up to a DSA standard school site. Mm -hmm. And so because we're making it a pre-K, um, program, we're not required to adhere to the same rigorous standards for facility construction as DSA requires. So that's why we were able to scale back cost and still achieve a significant amount of work for, for less money. Okay. Um, what is the initial budget for, for materials and labor? I mean, you know, it, it exclude the purchase price. I mean, well, uh, I think that that the initial budget starting way back when in 2014 was the 16.5 million. You take the $11 million that was spent for the purchase of the property, and then that would then make it $27 oh. million overall. Okay. And, and so far, are we um, over budget for this one? We are over budget for the revised scope of work. So when I took on this project, there was a budget of I believe $2.2 .2 million that was established. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there was a request made 
to increase the budget by four million dollars and the board approved it which then um mm -hmm. made the budget be six million dollars and then mm -hmm. as we were going through our different processes evaluating the scope we realized that those numbers there was no escalation that was included and also the scope changed significantly from when it was initially developed in 2015 2016. so that's when i came back and said hey we have to expand the scope and then that is also when uh, we started dealing with the city of fremont and they also changed their requirements for power roadway access lighting garbage disposal how how different facilities function in the city so we weren't prepared for that from the initial scope so that was what i had asked you all to assist us with before were some of those changes that we had encountered and now this is a um, unforeseen conditions kind of request in that we've we've dived into the project we started going in and repairing things and we've just been discovering just all kinds of mess that has to be repaired and so that is why I'm, I'm now back before you all again to to get the remainder of the funds that we believe will will finish this job mm -hmm. so so from uh, from 6.2 million and now we add i remember a 1 million and then plus last time is 500 and this time 500 so we basically it will will add another 2 million on top of correct point two. correct okay so now it's October 25, and the, our target is finished by December 20. Yes. So are we on target? We are on target to do that. Okay. If we have your approval and receive the additional funds that we're requesting, we are prepared to meet the December 20th date as planned. Uh, I just want to mention, because December 20, that's a holiday, I want to make sure that we, we have people to verify the completion of the project. And, oh yes, uh, and make sure that we are going to be successfully open as we we planned for the first week of January. You will have the district staff will still be working, even though the school sites and teachers and students will be gone. Uh, myself, as well as the construction teams and the mm -hmm. project management teams, we are we are not on vacation. The only day that they will not be there is probably the Friday before Christmas and then the New Year's Eve, but the rest of the days, those are considered regular construction working days. And so we will we will be there and they will be there working as well. Okay, well, thank you. And just make sure that we, we got all this, uh, you know, dots and check, you know, what, you know, all yes. the things that completed and there was no surprise, like, you know, we yes. have a disagreement with the contractor. We, we have been working so very closely that this uh, this particular contractor always makes jokes. He says, as much as I'm in Fremont and as much as I'm on this project, I just ought to like be in a Fremont employee because I spend all my time here all the time. So okay. that's, that's how much we're together with them on this project. So. Okay, great. Um, and you all, of course, are welcome anytime to call me or call uh, the construction manager and have a tour of the site but definitely call us before you come but you there's lots to see and i'm sure you all will have an education in the process i i i will sign up for them kelly i'm gonna call you okay <laughs> i'm gonna see do. all this dry rot <laughs> please, do. please do okay let's now move to uh oh i have one question see 14.7 um you know, with this supply chain, you know, during the COVID, we should look at the budget, you know, I mean, kind of give us self cushion. I think where I'm somewhere I, I, I read and the material is, is increasing. And uh, where do I read? Uh, we cannot, you know, materials is increasing. And, and uh, what's that construction, uh, labor are all increasing. Do you think we are at the risk of a um, of a rent out of budget? Well, we are in the process working with Banner to do an analysis right now for us to see where we are with our current projects that have not started. Um, I believe that we're okay with the projects that are already under construction, but we definitely have to do a cost analysis 
and a value proposition analysis on the projects that we still need to start to see where we kind of fall in line with those budgets since they were done more than five years ago. And we have all these changes that are happening now. So we are working on that and we'll be prepared to bring something to you all probably sometime in December or January. But we're trying to kind of see if things quiet down over the holidays and just don't keep ramping up. Mm -hmm. I think we should look at uh, look into this. I, I remember the 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 the, mati the, the comment I, I I read is from uh, CJ's uh, we weekend report. I don't want to mention the school project, and that's why you know the cost is going up, labor and material. We definitely are experiencing it, and fortunately, we have some very good contractors that are very knowledgeable and have very good relationships with their subcontractors and so we're we're working very closely with them to monitor that and to kind of hold the line in terms of our budgets that we have right now mm -hmm. but do you see if you need some material is it better to purchase them in advance because like do you see every three months the price is going up or what what well fortunately on several of our projects we did do just that so okay. um i when Thornton had its big budget increase, some of our big ticket items, we went ahead and purchased early. And we're very fortunate that, you know, we got our prices locked and supplies locked early. Mm -hmm. But some of our later projects, we're, because it's built in increments, we're not able to always buy all of the increments ahead of time. So we, we were, um, we took a position of buying like 20% extra so that as you're moving through the process and you have to buy more you you're always kind of on demand you always have supply on demand so we've been very fortunate so far that we haven't been too impacted on some of our bigger ticket items but we are still we are starting to feel the pressures of some of our um you know daily consumables and uh, in particular we have you know uh, structural steel is kind mm -hmm. of a, a hot topic right now all of our rubber products are kind of on the table and being monitored. And then all of our um, roof jacks for a lot of our equipment that goes on roofs, those are in hot demand right now and very hard to get a hold of. So we're tracking and, and seeing how those are trending and wherever we can get them, we're you know going as far as Canada, we're going as far as Florida to get a lot of products so that we can make sure that we can fulfill you know, the orders that we have for the work that we still have to do ahead of us. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that's what we have the contingencies for, right? But the contingencies this time, it means that other planning needs to be yeah, much better so that we can still stay within the contingency budget. Yeah. Now, uh, now one question here, I mean, are we on 14.7 now? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. So this is this is we are trying to to transfer from project to project, right? And uh, yes, yeah, so um, currently American High School is the modernization project that was completed last summer. Mm -hmm. uh, we finished out all of the final accounting on that project, and there currently is a million seven dollars that was not spent. So I I'm asking you all to give us permission to utilize those unused funds and actually transfer those dollars that are needed to the Washington High School project and be utilized there. And then also the balance remaining of the 1 million four can go back into the program contingency to be used for other projects as they come about. So is Washington going to run out of the budget including contingency, is that why you're asking for this? So our Washington project is 100% spent. We are at our full budget, including our contingency. And if you all recall, I think we took some items to board for approval back in, it was either August or September for mm -hmm. utilizing of the contingency budget on that job. And so all of the other remaining scope of work has been completed, but there are, um, other outstanding items that we still need these additional funds for uh, to complete the remainder of the scope of work. 
Um, in particular, there's um, two things have happened. So originally when this project was um, developed, um, the principal had stated that there were several uh, families that were going to be donating large pieces of equipment and, you know, basically kind of redoing the sound system and the control board and all the things that make a theater a theater. So we said, okay, well, if you're going to be getting those donated, then we don't need to include that stuff in our budget. So by us not including it in the budget and counting on what the principal had stated would happen has now forced our hand in that the donations did not occur. And so now the theater is not complete. It has one speaker and it has an old control board and the infrastructure that we designed for, we designed based on the new equipment that they expected to, to receive. And, you know, I've got a letter from him and a letter from another donor that says, yes, we're going to do it because, because originally I said, I'm not going to take this out of the budget until we have confirmation that we're actually going to get this stuff. And it's, oh, no, no, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Well, fast forward, here we, here we are in November and the theater is a theater, but it doesn't have all the things that make it a theater, whether it's sound or the control board and all the lighting. So that is kind of the bulk of what we're asking for in addition to some of the other things that were listed in the um, item. So it's, we're, we're kind of stuck because we have to do it, but then if we don't do it, then the instructional program that's supported by that space is not gonna have what they need. So, but I'm just trying to be creative in utilizing the dollars we have as to not impact all the other projects. And so I thought this was a, a good way of us using the dollars and recycling them back into uh, the school to add value. So where is the, uh, the additional lighting you've been there, the 44,000, 25,000, those, that's the, that's, that was the expected donation. Is that the, the two things? Are those the two things in the list? I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear what you just said. Uh, I see that there are two items in your list here. One is uh, additional lighting equipment for 44,000 and additional speakers for 25,000. Is yes. that, are those the two items you expected to get through donations? Yes. Okay. And then the rest of it, I mean, how come between August and now we have, uh, we have more uh, asks? Is that, are these, were these not seen before? I didn't, I'm, I apologize. I didn't quite hear the last part of your, your question. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that you, you have a $325,000 additional funds here, but your explanation covered about 70,000 of that. Correct. The rest of it, the rest of it between the last two months, uh, how did the scope change again? Uh, because some of you, this is a question that we have uh, every time is uh, in short uh, short periods of time how do how does the the requirements change and what the, how did we miss these in the previous uh, amendment that came to us a, a couple of months ago so if we look at the list um the um a, so the remounting of the theater sign, uh, the mm -hmm. fire damper model design, that was due to an existing condition conflict that when the IOR was doing his inspection, he uh, discovered the conflict and said that it needed to be changed. And when it was confirmed with the DSA inspector, then that's when they wrote a, a field change requirement for us. And so, um, for the fire damper and for a lot of the, so the asphalt conflicts and the um, path of traff, path of travel uh, costs, those were due to inspection deficiencies that were noted when the IOR and the DSA inspectors came out to the job site. And so it's just, it's not that they were missed. It's not that they were required at the time when the original scope of work was done. And so this happens often on renovation projects. Um, 
and it's left up to interpretation of people who are doing either the inspection or the design work. And so in this particular instance, we, we are beholding and, and have to comply with what our inspectors require us to do. And so um, the dry rot, of course, that's, that's another unforeseen condition. Um, the additional IT requirements, this is something that we are going to be discussing on some of the other projects too. So the IT for the spaces were designed back in 2017 when they were originally designed and our IT department signed off on it, but they changed their standards in January of last year. And so in going through doing an analysis or punch walk of the site, the IT department came up with a list of, you know, 30 different items that totaled, you know, over, you know, $35,000, $40,000. And I said, no, we can't, we can't make those kinds of changes because we are already locked into a design that was approved and has been executed on. And their argument to me is that, well, we should have asked them along the way for the changes. And that's not, that's not the best practice to do that. However you design <clears throat> it before you bid it is how it's gonna be built. So now, because the district standards have changed, we now have to make some adjustments to accommodate what those changes are. And so that's reflected in this cost as well. And because we did design the lighting and the sound according to that higher performing system, the IT also has to be modified to be able to support that as well. And so it's a, um, a combined overlay of modifications that need to occur that are going to support the theater as a whole. Okay. Well, I, I, I guess I hear what you're saying, but to, to me, to me, some of these things, the way um, it seems like our DSA standards or, or our whatever regulations that govern us keep changing every two years and our contracts are signed for a 10 year period or something like that, right? So, so how come this, as a, as the um, school district, we are responsible for all of the modification related costs and can the contracts be written any different? Uh, the contracts are going to be done differently. It will come, come uh, along the way. The contracts are going to be differently. And um, unfortunately, I can't speak to why the contracts were established the way they were because that was prior to my arrival. But since I have been here, I have been working with our legal counsel to redo our standard um, front end conditions for delivery of work, as well as the contract uh, templates that we will be using that also require have more stringent requirements for our designers as well as our contractors in adhering to uh, the established scope of work. So that is something that is in process. Okay, maybe uh, I'll catch up with you uh, separately uh, to understand some of that. Okay, I'd be more than happy to, to share any information that I have with you. Okay. I don't have any more questions here. Oh, oh I do have a fo uh, following up question. So, uh, since that, you know, we, um, you said we have a modified uh, a contract, uh, and those contracts are being uh, uh, reviewed by our attorney, right? Yes, they are actually being developed by the attorney. So, so then, we are working hand in hand with them. Right. So then based on what you observe in the field and you would say, okay, here is a, you know, a loophole or here is something we are not airtight. So we need to change that. So do we generally using one uh, contract, we, we, we can apply to all the, uh, the vendors? No, we actually have seven different contract templates that are used based on the type of contract and the type of service that's being provided. Mm -hmm. So we have architectural and engineering templates. We mm -hmm. have general contractor, we have small contractor, we have independent contractor. So if you have a single person that's doing work for us, and then we have various vendor contracts based on the products that they supply us. So there's 
there's many different kinds. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not a one size fits all. Okay, got it. Based on the scoop of work and uh, and the, the vendor size. Correct. Um, so I forgot my question. I mean, do, do we do we usually using our own contract? We tell the vendor, no, no, here's our contract and then yes. use our template, right? Yes. And they yes. may ask you to change some kind of a, a what do you call it, clause? Like, okay, we absolutely cannot disagree with this clause. Then we compromise on, on some of the clause. Is that right? Yes, that is true. They are legal counsel reviews all uh, modifications and requests for modifications before they're either approved or denied. Okay. I think, yeah, we, we should look at, you know, what we have done past, which is good. And what you said, it's sometimes is loose the language. So then we want to, you know, make it airtight. So. Okay. So we are definitely in the process of doing that. Okay. All right. So that's uh, the last one. Yeah, that's the last item. Wow, our timing is perfect. <laughs> so, uh, well, I thought we'd be done in ten minutes, but uh, yeah, yeah, and and uh, and and, and, yeah. and then you 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 have those uh, specific questions on, on yeah, yeah, items, yeah, exactly. which are also very good, you know. Uh, it's good to drill deeper into you know, when when we have time. Right? So, okay, very good. So, thank you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, trustees. Thank you, staff. See you, See you Wednesday. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>